Do you worry about squamous cell carcinoma? Has your doctor talked with you about that? Did you know in 1957, a Johns Hopkins Medical School textbook said that a fungal infection on the skin mimics squamous cell carcinoma? Let's go over that. Your doctor doesn't know this. I'm hoping you will learn this today. Alan North is gonna be here. He's the keto guy. And I asked him, Alan, what is the real ketogenic diet? What is it? And what's the difference between what's in your container of keto med and that diet? Today we're gonna to talk about natural antifungals, milk thistle, you know, thymol, things like caprylic acid, all sorts of good stuff on today's Know the Cause. Thank you for telling a friend. Let's take it away. For the past 45 years, I have dedicated my life and my whole career to finding the root cause of disease. And I now know with certainty that we must play a role in our own health care. I'm a self-care advocate. You know what? Every time you change your diet for the better, exercise, or swallow a nutritional supplement, so are you. Now welcome to Know the Cause. This is a medical textbook that, as you see, I've read many times. It comes out of Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, circa 1957. It was autographed by the guy who bought it in medical school in uh, 1957. His name is David Weekly. He paid $6.75 for it. A wealth of information. The clinical and immunologic aspects of fungal diseases. So dermatologists, those who study the skin, really kind of understand, at least they get a course in fungus. I want to read you uh, a headline. Man, we, I, I relocated my whole family to Dallas from Los Angeles at his request in 1987, and we're still here. He passed a few years later. Um, but man, there's a wealth of information. This book says four times, this fungus mimics a fungal infection. This fungus mimics a fungal infection. I have to wonder how much of what dermatologists or family doctors or cancer doctors see isn't really fungus, right? Okay, so here, a couple of years ago, I saved this headline for you. Fungal infections may mimic cancer. This comes out of Dermatology Time, circa 2014. I wonder how the good David Weekly would have interpreted that. By now, I would have been working with him 30-some years, and he would have said, yeah, makes perfect sense. He probably would have authored it. Shh. Headlines like these just get buried. If a doctor doesn't learn in their medical training that something starts that bump or lump, and it might be fungus, which grows in a sack very often, to protect itself from our white blood cells, um, you know, they wouldn't have any idea, folks, and many doctors don't. Okay, now... <clears throat> A 1957 medical textbook on fungus revealed this, and this is the book on page 115, that skin infections caused by blastomyces fungus is frequently mistaken for squamous cell carcinoma. What is this blastomycete? Well, it lives in areas of the U.S. and Canada surrounding the Ohio and Mississippi River Valleys and the Great Lakes. I mean, this is pretty common. So if you have squamous cell diagnosis, well, you've got cancer. That's what's growing on your ear or your skin somewhere. Is it really? frequently, frequently, not on weekends, not every other Wednesday, frequently mistaken for squamous cell carcinoma. There it is right in the middle. It is, this fungus is frequently mistaken for squamous cell carcinoma. That's a big wow, isn't it? Well, there's another paper that came out a couple years after that 2014 paper, and this is it. Squamous cell carcinoma mimicking a fungal infection. Wait a minute. So this is real cancer, but it's mimicking a little fungus. I'm so lost, folks. I get so lost on these things. Squamous cell car that's a real cancer, but it mimics a fungal infection, so treat it as a real cancer. Is it or isn't it? If 60, 70 years ago, one of our premier medical schools was talking about squamous cell carcinoma, that's not it. It's blastomycete in the ground. When the wind blows, you live out there in the Ohio, Mississippi Valleys, Canada, you're breathing this, inhaling it, and boom. Let's see what this paper says, okay? Squamous cell carcinoma mimicking fungal infection. This paper referred to a 61-year-old man who was receiving chemotherapy for a type of cancer he had. He poked his finger while gardening and grew a small mass on his finger. Now, chemotherapy suppresses our immune system. So he's vulnerable to both new cancer formation or metastasis 
and fungal infections. It's fascinating, isn't it? He's vulnerable to regrowth of his cancer or a fungal infection. When your immunity dips, you're vulnerable to fungal or bacterial or any kind of infection, okay? And look at this next graphic. This doctor diagnosed sporotrichosis. It's a fungal infection, and sometimes it grows on thorns, and ordered a tissue culture, which is in a Petri dish, and a histology. This is a microscope examination of the wound, which was excised, surgically removed, right? They cut it out. The patient began taking the antifungal drug Sporinox. Tissue cultures showed uh, a type of candida yeast, but histology revealed a different diagnosis. See, the doctor in pathology said you have squamous cell carcinoma in C2. In C2 means it's a local growth and it hasn't metastasized. So, wow. So, the Petri dish says you got fungus. Yet the doctor in pathology said, no, no, this is in C2. This is carcinoma, squamous cell. Folks, are our pathologists trained to see fungus as squamous cell carcinoma? I don't know the answer to that, but it should scare you. It scares me, okay? So did he have fungus or did he have cancer? This case resolved with excision or cutting it open and Spornox, but it's really confusing. Since the patient was already on chemotherapy, did it resolve the case since the wound was diagnosed as cancer, or was the case resolved by Spornox, now approved as a cancer drug, it's an antifungal drug, because the wound was caused by fungus. And it ends, that paper ended with this. This highlights the importance of biopsy since squamous cell carcinoma and fungal infection cannot be distinguished on clinical grounds alone. What if all our pathologists learned in their medical training looking at billions of slides, that's not fungus. That's squamous cell carcinoma or basal cell carcinoma. I don't know the answer, but if I had this, I'd talk to my doctor about fungus. Beth asked the really relevant question, hey Doug, doesn't sugar feed cancer? Beth, I've found this fascinating through the years that both fungus and cancer cells thrive in the presence of sugar. And yet oncologists, you will go in and see them doing chemotherapy on patients and they have all sorts of sweets and sodas and goodies for them to eat. I'll never understand that, okay? But yes, cancer cells thrive in the presence of sugar and fungal cells thrive in the presence of sugar, leading me to believe that sometimes they might be one and the same, and they are. This is pretty well documented now. We know that aflatoxin is a poisonous byproduct, a mycotoxin made by mold, and it causes hepatocellular cancer, liver cancer. And so we have to be very, very careful with these mycotoxins. One of the things we do, remember, only fungi make mycotoxins, so we have to starve these living parasites out of our body. That's what the Kaufman diet does. You get on that diet, and then you look for healthy antifungal supplements, vitamin C, niacin, all of these, zinc, these have antifungal properties. So in addition to getting that nutrient in your body, you're starving and not feeding fungus and you can kill it with some of these good, good supplements or medications, Spornox, Nizorol, you hear me talk about these all the time. These are antifungal medications. If I had cancer, I'd ask my doctor for Spornox, which has now been approved to treat certain cancers. It's a drug that kills toenail fungus, go figure. Spornox and the Kaufman diet, and then check my tumor markers every couple of months and see if I'm going in the right direction. I hope that helps, Beth. How many of you at home have a keto bar, a keto meal replacement? How many of you know what ketogenic is? How many of you heard the word? It's funny because I've, Alan North joins me right now, the, uh, the dad of Keto Med, the guy who started all this and got me all excited about it years ago. Uh, I've known that word for probably 40, 45 years right. since I was working in California in clinical nutrition. Uh, a mother came to me and told me that her daughter had epilepsy and she was fine as long as she stayed on the keto diet. 
and I, we didn't have, you know, hey Siri, tell me about keto diet. I had to go to the library and look up keto means ketogenic. Right. So Alan, welcome aboard. You studied you, this Jim. thoroughly. Uh, it's amazing how much study you did. And you wanted to go on it because you want to lose some weight, yeah. you want to feel good and so forth. And you were bringing me bars and things like people have at home right now. And man, when I began to read them, I thought, holy yeah. cow, is that really ketogenic? It's interesting, Doug, because we, we do go back 30 years. And I remember, you know, you, you, you have eaten, you, you eat, drink, and sleep nutrition, and you have for decades. And I remember, I knew that you understood the ketogenic diet, and I had been researching it long, decades ago. And I think you and I were both astounded when it became popular and then we looked at all the products that were out there that were that were called keto and ketogenic and we instantaneously realized that wow they're called keto they're called ketogenic these products are everywhere but they're not really ketogenic a lot of aren't, Alan, and you have to be what so i went to the store the other day and looked at a couple ketogenic purportedly ketogenic and I'm telling you, maltodextrin yeah. and corn sweeteners and corn fiber, what in the world? That shouldn't be in a pure keto diet. Ketogenic is, a, is, a, is, is not only a scientific definition, but it's a, it's a mathematical definition. It's based on percentages. Um, and so when you're on a true ketogenic, it's not just low carb. Uh, that, 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 that's not the definition of ketogenic. I'm on a low carb, no carb diet. That doesn't mean you're keto or ketogenic. It has to be, it's all based on math and ingredients. So the ingredients have to be pure. They have to, they, it can't be coming from carbohydrates and sugar sources like corn, corn byproducts, citric acid, maltodextrin, those types of things. Those are, those are automatically disqualified on a true ketogenic diet. Um, protein. Um, too much protein is, is, is not ketogenic either. And a lot of these products, they, they have a lot of protein and they think that just by, by making it low carb that it's automatically ketogenic and it's not the case. Or just by making it high fat, low carb, doesn't necessarily make it ketogenic either because not all fats are the same, not all protein is the same. So for example, let's say that you're on a really high fat diet. The, let's say you have two identical twins. One's on a, on a ketogenic, they're both on ketogenic diets, they're both on high fat diets, except one is taking in mostly canola oil, whereas the other is taking in healthy fats like MCTs, uh, olive oil, those types of fats. Two different results will happen even though the macronutrients are the same and they're both on high fat diets, meaning that not all keto is the same, not all keto products are the same. If they've got too much protein or the wrong types of fats, they're not keto. Um, even even the, 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 the products that say MCTs on them, right. you look at the label more, more often than not, it's like, where's the MCTs? It says MCTs on it. I, all I see is coconut oil. Well, I thought coconut oil was MCTs. No, MCTs are in coconut oil. So if a product has coconut oil, they can, put on the front of that label, it has MCTs. And it might technically be the case, but in keto meds case, it's not coconut oil. It's MCTs that have been extracted from coconut oil, but just like with fats and proteins, not all MCTs are the same. There's four different MCTs. There's, uh, uh, we were talking about it before the, before the show. We, there's, there's capric acid, caproic acid, uh, lauric acid and caprylic acid, those are four different types of MCTs. The caprylic acid, otherwise known as C8, is 90% of the MCT contained within keto med. So of the 20 grams of pure purified MCTs, not just coconut oil, purified MCTs, 90% of those MCT fats are C8, very hard to find in other products, very rare. Uh, it's a very expensive extraction process, um, uh, and so most companies aren't going to go through that type of expense. And then not only that, it's different in terms of not only the amount of protein, but the type of protein. Because if you're on a really clean ketogenic diet, you don't want conventional protein. You don't want protein that might have antibiotics in them or hormones, those types of things, the conventional milk type uh, 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 proteins. These are protein isolates in, in precise ratios. Um, and not only that, you see a lot of these brands that are called keto brands out there, and they want you to buy everything. 
They want you to fill up the shopping cart. They want you to buy keto. Everything's called keto. They want you to buy the keto protein, the keto collagen, the keto vitamins. I mean, since when is collagen and protein even called keto? The keto separate MCTs, which are really expensive. Um, and then again, what are those MCTs? And so with keto med, it, it sometimes appears, it might appear to be more expensive, but when you add it all up and you look at how many servings you're getting, you're getting a full 30 servings, uh, maximum potency in terms of the key ingredients, then a lot of times you'll, you'll, you'll conclude that when I look at Keto Med and I look at the other products that are called Keto, even though they look cheaper, even though they seem less expensive, when I do all the math, Keto Med's actually less expensive. It is from a purity standpoint. I, I would agree with you on that because I walked through, I, I watched you borrow the money, <laughs> a lot of money to do this. Alan, I didn't know before you came to me, I really didn't know. I saw MCT oil and I thought, okay, that's a good keto. Right. I really didn't know about C8 and, right. and all of these. I saw what you went through, I saw your expenses, I saw that you wanted a product on the market that was different. There are some good keto products on the market today. It's up to us, the onus is on you and me to really understand. I don't think I've ever heard a better uh, a summary of what's in your product than that. And, and, and it's important. The, the C8 becomes important. It's not just about, I mean, when it, when it comes to nutritional supplements, what company doesn't talk in terms of we have the best quality? It's, it's, it's one thing to say we have the best quality, but I can illustrate why this is the best quality, how it's the best quality. C8 caprylic acid will raise ketone levels 10 times more than coconut oil and three times more than even other MCTs. So it's, it's a big difference. It really is, and thank you for putting your heart into this. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's really, that's the way he approaches all of his products. Ketomed.com, go there and look at what he's really created. I mean, it's, it's powerful what you're doing. Thank you very much wow, for the integrity you. that you exude in every product. Uh, Ketomed.com. That's why people are getting great results. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was trying to find a date on this. Every home ought to have a copy of this. This is PDR, Physician's Desk Reference for Herbal Medicines. Wow, I probably got this 20 years ago. There are hundreds of herbs that have natural properties. Uh, we need to know about this, folks. We need to know about this. It's really important. A case in point is what I want to talk with you about the next five minutes. But PDR, that stands for Physician's Desk Reference for Herbal Medications. You can probably buy this online for five or ten bucks. A wealth of information in here, okay? Let's get started. Candida albicans causes most fungal and yeast infections in humans. Well, most of the fungal infections, right? Not bacterial. Candida albicans causes most fungal and yeast infections in humans. When it overgrows inside our bodies, it wrecks havoc on our health to the point that doctors and medications become involved. I believe that proper diet and supplements help prevent overgrowth. Now, we know there's an antibiotic link. And look, 50 years ago when I was in Vietnam, Antibiotics were almost the gospel. Any problem, you put people on antibiotics. It still is in many medical clinics today. And it's come back to snap us. Antibiotics can be lifesavers. But there's an ugly side to antibiotics too that we are witnessing now because we've become so aggressive with them, right? Okay, so know that fungus, Candida albicans over Aspergillus or Penicillium or any of the others, Candida albicans, a single cell fungus, seems to be most problematic with people uh, whose immunity dips a little or we get into too much candy or we took too many antibiotics or we drink too much alcohol and I could go on and on. Before minor problems with yeast overgrowth becomes a major problem, know that science seems to be on the side of health food stores. Here are a few natural remedies that you should talk to your doctor about if you're experiencing, you know, symptoms of yeast and mold overgrowth. Now, many of you will go to the doctor and he'll say, wow, that's a huge ringworm problem. I don't want you on a supplement. I'm going to put you on X. I'm going to put you on thiabendazole. I'm going to put you on Nystatin. You know, okay, uh, that would be great. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes doctors see these skin conditions 
and write prescriptions for antibiotics or a shot of cortisone right away. Uh, if it's fungal, that uh, talk to your doctor. Talk to your doctor. Doctor, I want you to rule out, I want you to do what the Center for Disease Control has told us three years in a row. I want you to think fungus here. Because I got a mole, I got an athlete's foot, you know, I have some vaginal yeast. My scalp has seborrheic dermatitis, which is a fungus. Uh, and so I want you to think fungus. Could I try an antifungal diet, Kaufman's antifungal diet, and some supplements? Well, which would you like to try? Here we go. Milk thistle, so Marin uh, Meranium, or milk thistle, contains a wide range of phytochemicals. Those are plant chemicals, including psilocybin, which have antifungal activity. So says a paper uh, done in 2019. Proper dietary supplements show anti-candida activity, antibiotics, it's called. 2019, just a short time ago. Caprylic acid, thyme, and oregano. Caprylic acid is a fatty acid contained in palm oil and coconut oil. You guys know that. Thymol is essential oil found in thyme. Carvacol, carvacrol is an essential oil found in oregano. When caprylic acid is used with thyme and carvacrol, it resulted in almost 100% reduction in candida growth. This is a medical paper said this. So you see, very often, that's very technical. What did Doug say? Oregano, thyme, T-H-Y-M-E. Caprylic acid, you know, these are all available, milk thistle, these are all available in health food stores. And these are scientific papers. Uh, cell physiology and biochemistry, that last paper on caprylic acid, thyme, and oregano, huge medical research. Folks, this isn't the type of paper your doctor's going to read. So we have to. You have Know the Cause to walk you through. Now, here's what I've done for years. Knowthecause.com, for over a decade, we have been honored to have fungal researcher Dr. Luke Curtis update us monthly with scientific articles that continue to educate on fungus and ill health. What you do is go to knowthecause.com, go over there to articles, pull that down, then go to the science of fungus and click on that. Hundreds of articles will be available for you to read. Articles like I just read you here. An educated consumer can be a really healthy consumer. Before you get sick, would diet and supplements help? That's your call. We learned a lot today, didn't we? Most importantly, we learned about Keto Med. Many of your coffee drinkers take a half a scoop of that in your coffee and stir it in. Mwah. Absolutely delicious. See that little scooper? That comes in each uh, container. Do try that. There are some of you who need to talk to your doctor if you have a lot of symptoms about substituting a meal or two with a full scoop of keto med. You'll put yourself into ketosis. That's not a bad thing. Ketoacidosis, those of you who are type 1 diabetics, you won't go into ketoacidosis. So often doctors confuse those two. Thank you, Ellen. Always good to see you here on Know the Cause. This book, folks, this is the very book, 1957, Johns Hopkins University. This book says four times that different molds and fungi mimic cancer. 55, 60 years ago we knew this, and we don't know it today, and it was given to students at the medical school. Something's wrong, folks. Cancer sometimes has a fungal etiology. That's been documented. Natural antifungals. Now you know. I once had a person interviewing me on uh, television. He said, when I walk into a health food store, how many antifungals are in there? And I said, okay, you got the spinach and you got the squash and you got the foods. Then you got zinc and vitamin C and the B vitamins and other minerals. Most of them are antifungal. That's the way God set it up. God bless you folks. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.